and the positive likelihood ratio can save lives. Imagine this, one morning I wake up with a sharp pain in my chest, like I've been hit by a truck. Panic sets in. Is this a heart attack? I call an ambulance. As I wait, paramedics rush in and run a quick blood test called troponin to check for heart muscle damage. The positive likelihood ratio of this test is high. This means a positive result strongly suggests I am having a heart attack. It allows doctors to act fast and confidently, potentially saving my life. So the positive likelihood ratio answers one critical question. How much should you trust the positive test result? Namely, the positive likelihood ratio tells us how much likely a positive result is in a sick person compared to a healthy one. That's why it's called positive. It focuses on positive test results. The simplest way to calculate the positive likelihood ratio is this. It's the true positive rate divided by the false positive rate. Here's what that means. The true positive rate, also called sensitivity, tells you how often the test correctly identifies people who have the disease. The false positive rate, which is 1 minus specificity, shows how often the test mistakenly says healthy people are sick. If you want to dig deeper, you could even calculate it using a confusion matrix. But honestly, you don't need to, because tools like the AP tests function from the APR package do the math for you. But why does positive likelihood ratio matter? Well, it combines sensitivity and specificity into a single number that works across different situations. Unlike predictive values, which change depending on how common the disease is, aka prevalence, positive likelihood ratio stays consistent, independent of prevalence. This makes it a universal tool for evaluating diagnostic tests or even comparing machine learning models. With a simple rule, the higher the positive likelihood ratio, the better the model. Since positive likelihood ratio is a ratio, the interpretation is similar to any ratio. If it is below 1, the test is worse than random guessing. Avoid it. If it is equal to 1, the test offers no useful information. Ignore it. When positive likelihood ratio is between 1 and 5, the test is somewhat helpful, but not definitive. So use it with caution. But when it is between 5 and 10, the test is moderately strong. And finally, if positive likelihood ratio exceeds 10, the test is very strong, meaning a positive result is highly reliable. For example, let's take predicting survival on the Titanic. And positive likelihood ratio of 8 means that a prediction of survival is 8 times more likely for someone who actually survived than for someone who didn't. But wait, what about that chest pain? You know, the one that screamed heart attack. Well, after I called the ambulance and finally calmed down enough to think straight, I realized something. My New Year's resolution to get shredded let me totally overtrain my pecs yesterday. While positive likelihood ratio is fantastic for interpreting positive test results, what happens when the test comes back negative? Well, in this case, we'll need the negative likelihood ratio, which focuses on negative results and, in many aspects, is the opposite of positive likelihood ratio. Let me explain. The negative likelihood ratio answers another critical question. How much can you trust a negative test result? In plain terms, negative likelihood ratio tells us how much more likely a negative result is in a healthy person compared to someone who is sick. That's why it's called negative. It focuses on negative test results. In machine learning, negative likelihood ratio works similarly. It tells us how well a model predicts negatives when they are truly negative versus when they are positive. The math behind negative likelihood ratio is straightforward. It's the opposite of the positive likelihood ratio. Instead of using sensitivity in the numerator, we use 1 minus sensitivity, also known as the false negative rate. This tells us how often the test misses sick people. In the denominator, instead of 1 minus specificity, we use specificity, or the true negative rate, which tells us how often the test correctly identifies healthy people. 
In simpler terms, negative likelihood ratio compares the chance of a negative result in sick people to the chance of a negative result in healthy people. The negative likelihood ratio is especially useful for ruling things out. The interpretation is simple. The lower the negative likelihood ratio, the better. For instance, if negative likelihood ratio is below 0.1, the test is excellent in ruling out the condition. If it is between 0.1 and 0.5, like in our example, the test is decent, but not perfect. If it is between 0.5 and 1, the test has limited value. And when negative likelihood ratio exceeds 1, the test is unreliable. Let's go back to the Titanic survival example. If negative likelihood ratio is 0.5, flipping it gives us 2. This means predicting someone didn't survive is twice as likely for someone who truly didn't survive than for someone who did. In summary, a good diagnostic test or machine learning model should excel in two key areas. Confirming positives, this is indicated by positive likelihood ratio greater than 1, and ruling out negatives, this is reflected by a negative likelihood ratio less than 1. If both ratios are bad, meaning the positive likelihood ratio is below 1 and the negative likelihood ratio is above 1, the test or model is essentially useless. Thus, this small likelihood ratio part of confusion matrix results offers a quick, powerful and incredibly practical way to access model quality. And I personally think it's super underrated. Hey, if you found this video helpful, a like would mean the world to me. It helps others find it and keeps me motivated to create more content that makes your life easier. Thank you. Now, while positive likelihood ratio and negative likelihood ratio are excellent for evaluating how well a test or a model performs in confirming positives or ruling out negatives, their results are very directional, either towards positive or towards negative. But sometimes we want a single metric that summarizes the overall performance of a test or model without splitting it into positive and negative directions. And that's where the diagnostic odds ratio comes in. Use diagnostic odds ratio when you need a single number to represent the overall diagnostic power of a test or a model. Use it also when you are comparing multiple tests or models and want a quick way to rank them. Finally, use diagnostic odds ratio if you don't care about distinguishing between positive likelihood ratio and negative likelihood ratio, but rather want a holistic view of how well the test discriminates between sick and healthy individuals, like accuracy, while being completely independent of prevalence, unlike accuracy. So, high diagnostic odds ratio means the test is great at telling sick and healthy people apart. And while we can get diagnostic odds ratio from the summary of epi tests function, we can also easily calculate it in several ways. Here is the simplest one, dividing the positive likelihood ratio by the negative likelihood ratio. Alternatively, you can calculate diagnostic odds ratio directly from the confusion matrix or using sensitivity and specificity. By the way, if you want exclusive access to the R code and transcripts, feel free to join my channel as a member. Like a regular odds ratio, the diagnostic odds ratio ranges from 0 to infinity. The diagnostic odds ratio below 1 indicates a poor test. And the diagnostic odds ratio greater than 1 is good, and the higher the number, the better our model performs. Diagnostic odds ratio is especially useful for comparing tests or models. If you have several options, the one with the highest diagnostic odds ratio is likely the best. Our diagnostic odds ratio of 17 shows that our model is very informative. Now listen to me very carefully. While diagnostic odds ratio is robust to slight imbalances in your data, for example, more healthy people than sick, it can become unstable in two situations. First, small sample sizes. If there aren't enough true positives or true negatives, the ratios can get skewed. Second, extreme imbalance. If one group is vastly larger than the other, for example 99% healthy versus 1% sick, diagnostic odds ratio might not tell the full story. 
In real life scenarios where imbalance is pretty common, you'll want metrics that handle these challenges better, like the F1 score, critical success index, and Matthews correlation coefficient, which will help you evaluate models even in the most imbalanced datasets. And thus, to learn all about them, just watch this video next.